Okay. okay. So if I can just figure out how to share this screen here, and I think I just hit this thing. Let's try that. Okay. Yeah, hit the green thing. It should say share screen. Share screen. Okay. And also, if you don't mind giving us a little bit more background of some about yourself that wasn't necessarily in that uh, introduction, uh, and, sure. and maybe why you're coming out now, and how you're able to even speak about this work. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've always had an interest in aircraft uh, from the very beginning. Uh, my father used to take me to the Oshkosh Air Show, which is really, like you mentioned, the largest air show in the world. Of course, they had a lot of uh, one-tenth of all the world's aircraft are at that show. And uh, But I really wanted to see what, the, what was behind the scenes, what was going on within the military-industrial complex, talking about Lockheed Martin. Boeing Phantom Works, um, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop Grumman, what they were doing. That's what really spurred my interest and that's the focus of my research. Okay. Uh, Mike, Michael, okay, if, you could, if you could click start slideshow so that you have your slideshow for the whole screen, that'd be awesome. From beginning, you can click that, there you go. From beginning, from beginning. Okay, I got that. So, are you guys able to see this? Yeah, I can see it. Yes, it's you can coming see up. It. Okay. Yeah, I can see. I it. Can. You see? Okay. okay. So you yeah, see you can, you can just go ahead and do your PowerPoint. We see you, and we see your whole PowerPoint. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. So that's you know kind of basically the introduction here. And what I want to do in this presentation is take you behind the scenes within the military industrial complex and determine where our tax dollars have been disappearing the last four years. Uh, bottom line is we have a right to know where our tax dollars are going. And uh, the Air Force, the Department of Defense, they are merely temporary custodians. Let me repeat that, temporary custodians of those assets, the aircraft, the hangars, the runways, the facilities, the employees, the payments, uh, their, their salaries, they're nothing more than temporary custodians of those assets. We as taxpayers own these assets, so we have a right to question authority and find out where our tax dollars are disappearing here. Uh, quick review of the source materials so you can see where I'm getting this. I'm not just making this up. The visual aids used in this presentation are computer-generated forensic composite illustrations which are originated from actual eyewitness accounts in military defense trade publications. Source material includes Aviation Week Space Technology, the Jane's Defense Weekly, AIAA, which is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Antelope Valley, Edwards Air Force Base Historical Archives Department, ASU Newspaper Archives Department, University of Arizona, Time Magazine, National Journal, and Library of Congress, just to show you. So, uh, we are basically just days away now, and I really want to stress this point, from a very significant anniversary, talking about the 32nd anniversary of the Challenger disaster, January 28th, 1986. Extremely historical in American history. And uh, just want to point out that after launch, 72 seconds after launch, the uh, Challenger exploded. We lost seven astronauts, seven heroes. Did this really have to happen? Did this need to happen? Is there something that could have been done to avoid it? Here's our astronauts here, our, our, our heroes. Was this really necessary to, to lose our astronauts is the, the question I want to look at this here. Now, keep in mind, the temperature at launch pad just prior to liftoff on January 28, 1986, was 26 degrees Fahrenheit, far below the minimum operating temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit as mandated by Morgan Thiokol. Now, they're the ones who are the primary contractors for these solid rocket boosters, including the O-rings. So even their own engineers stated that you're not supposed to launch the shuttle below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but on the day of the launch, it was at 26 degrees. So NASA upper management, they already knew, they already knew that they're, they're way in the red at this point. They should never even be launching at all. But here's what's really interesting. The shuttle main in external tank has two tanks embedded within it. There's a liquid hydrogen tank and a liquid oxygen tank. 
the liquid hydrogen has a gas exit port near the lower portion of the shuttle. Okay, so already, according to the reports, we're at 26 degrees Fahrenheit. But when this stiff wind on that morning came by and the liquid hydrogen is gassing through the bottom, it chilled that whole area down another 10 degrees. So we're looking at 16 degrees Fahrenheit on the morning of the launch. We're way out of spec here. So they already knew that. They absolutely already knew that. And I want to take you through just kind of a brief overview and a shot by shot kind of picture illustration of what actually took place uh, within the Challenger explosion. And I have to give credit to my good friend Tom Bogan for putting these together for me. Now, this illustration is pretty much kind of at, at uh, T plus mm, maybe 200 milliseconds after explosion. You can see the external tank has fractured. The two SRBs are beginning to cross in front of the shuttle. This is the view outside from inside the shuttle cockpit looking outside. Now keep in mind, they're still climbing at this point. They haven't reached the top of the parabolic arc, so they're still climbing. This would have been the view from the inside cockpit looking out, and for those first 200, 300 milliseconds, they still would have had this light within the cockpit. Now, just after that happens, they would have lost uh, power, electrical power and lighting within the cockpit. You can see here looking out the uh, Challenger windscreen, crew compartment, windshield, the SRB is now beginning to cross in front of them. We're coming down further now. We're, we're reaching up the top of the parabolic arc. Now we're starting our descent from the top of the parabolic arc, now going down. Uh, you can see various uh, manuals within the uh, Challenger crew compartment are floating now within there. They're, they're basically at zero G. And here's the shot that you don't want to see. This is the shot of the astronauts seeing the ocean approaching them. Now, we know for a fact that at least three astronauts were alive after the explosion because we heard it on the transcripts, and we also know that three oxygen auxiliary power uh, units were turned on. They could only be turned on manually. So we know for a fact that at least three crew members were alive after the explosion. Here is the moment just prior to impact. You can see the ocean rushing up against the astronauts. Definitely not something you want to see. Okay, so now we're approaching uh, the impact point. You can see the nose of the Challenger getting ready to hit the ocean. We're coming in a little bit closer now. You can see the uh, left side of the uh, fuselage. This is the exact moment of impact uh, at this point. And I've got other re uh, research that I'm going to go into later and tell you just how fast they were traveling and the amount of G-forces that were exhibited on the forward fuselage section of the Challenger. Here's a deep impact at this point. Uh, at this point, the entire crew compartment shattered into multiple pieces. Now, for the purpose of this illustration, I've shown them together, but what really happened was a lot more graphic and a lot more severe than what we're showing here. Okay, so now the crew compartment is sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Various debris is coming off the Challenger. Another shot here uh, of the crew compartment. This is zoomed in now. You can see beginning to fracture and different parts are coming off. And this is the final uh, chapter in Challenger. Uh, like I mentioned before, this was a lot more graphic and violent than what was shown here. Actually, the bodies were dismembered. It was a horrible scene. It should never have happened, but this is the final result of Challenger. Now, I want to point out that this is from Los Angeles Times, July 29th, 1986. I want to basically give you my uh, sources for this. Challenger crew was conscious after blast. NASA reports at least three emergency air packs were activated. Uh-oh, heard on cabin tape. So no doubt about it, it's a, it's a done deal. We know that at least three astronauts were conscious as they were coming down. Now, here's the part that's interesting. Uh, the source is Journal of Rockets and Spacecraft, November, December, 1986. And according to Thomas uh, Wersbicki, he's from the Cambridge Masses uh, University, the Challenger crew compartment impacted the ocean traveling approximately 180 miles per hour, which was equivalent to 150 Gs. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's just no way they can survive.
there's just no 150 G's is, is a fatal blow. No question about it. Absolutely. But the problem is during the Reagan administration, the budgetary restraints and the cost overruns on the Rockwell Challenger um, shuttle enterprise uh, space uh, planes at that time, they were just getting way cost overruns and there was no crew egress system designed for the crew. And if there was such a uh, system, it's been said that they could have swam home and been home for dinner that night. We could have saved them, but it just didn't happen because cost overruns and they just didn't do it. So they could have survived the explosion. So I'm not going to candy coat this. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to call it like it is. And it's my assessment that every American taxpayer should have a vendetta against NASA upper management for number one, going against the ruling of the contractor, number two, criminal negligence resulting in the murder of the seven Challenger astronauts. So no doubt about it, I'm not sure according to that's the fact. They knew it in advance. They went against the ruling of the contractors. They launched at 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Their, their negligence, they're, they're to blame. Okay, so what can we learn from this? And could it have been avoided? And do we have technology that's leapfrogging all rockets at this time? Let me hit you with a couple statements by our good friend, uh, Ben Rich, who's the former Lockheed manager of the Skunk Works between 1975 and 1991. He said, aerospace design has passed the brute force stage. Let me repeat that. Aerospace design has passed the brute force stage. Anytime, ladies and gentlemen, you hear the term brute force, you're talking about rockets. We're talking about liquid rockets, solid rockets, the kind of rockets the Nazis used over 70 years ago in World War II. How, why are we still using rockets now? The, the Mercury uh, space uh, program, the Apollo program, the shuttle program, everything the Russians are doing, we're still using these liquid rockets. This is so obsolete. Here's another one. I wish I could tell you about the projects we are currently working on. They are both fascinating and fantastic. They call for technologies only once only dreamed of by science fiction writers. So here's Ben Rich talking about technologies that are fascinating and fantastic, something that you would see in a science fiction novel. And I wanna also point out that just before Ben Rich died in 1995, he spoke to my very good friend, Jim Goodall, who's another aviation researcher and black aircraft historian. And basically, Ben Rich told Jim Goodall over the phone, he said, Jim, we have things in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. So here we have the head of Lockheed Skunk Works basically admitting on his deathbed that they have technologies that are 50 years beyond what we can even comprehend. So did Challenger need to happen? Do we need to have liquid rockets? According to Ben Rich, it's a done deal. We're already way beyond it. We're already way beyond it. We're the ones being played for the fools. We're the ones living in this matrix dream world. There absolutely is a secret space program. Now, I spent years researching Ben Rich, the Skunk Works, trying to piece this story together over 25 years. And I've come up with a crossword puzzle that includes all these deep state secrets within this crossword puzzle. There's 116 clues. And for this particular audience only, for this particular uh, presentation, I'm offering a $1,000 cash prize. Let me repeat that. $1,000 cash prize for anyone who can complete this crossword puzzle by January 23rd, 2018, no later than 11.59 p.m. PST Tuesday, this Tuesday. So this is for only people listening to this broadcast at this time. If you can solve the puzzle before the deadline, the $1,000 cash prize is yours. First one who does it gets the prize. You can hit me up at Facebook. Uh, I'll send you a copy of the blueprint, the, the crossword puzzle, or you can email me at A-U-R-O-R-A C-A-D is in dog, the number five at AOL.com. Okay, let's keep going now. Look at what we see here. We hear uh, Dr. Stephen Greer talking about breakthroughs in propulsion were done in October 1954. Is there any way to back that statement up? Turns out he's correct. From the reference works, 
the newspaper clippings, they bear this out. Council Bluffs, 1127, 1955. Conquest of gravity aim of top scientists in US. One almost fantastic possibility is that if gravity can be understood and scientifically negated or neutralized in some relatively inexpensive manner, it will be possible to build aircraft, Earth satellites, and even spaceships that will move swiftly into outer space without strain beyond the pull of Earth's gravity field. They would not have to wrench themselves away through the brute force, there's that statement again, of powerful rockets and through expenditure of expensive chemical fuels. Here's another one. The jet age is obsolete and the rocket age. You old men of 25 or 30 years still plodding along in the jet age, wake up. Jet propulsion is obsolete. The, the Sputnik will shortly appear as crude as the wax wings of Icarus. I love the way they did this here. It says, we are entering the age of anti-gravity space travel. Spherical craft made weightless and propelled by anti-gravity engines may soon attain almost the speed of light or 600 million miles per hour. This is not a dream. Since 1953, the Canadian government has been working on Project Magnet. At least 14 US universities and other research centers are trying to crack the gravity barrier. Teams of researchers and engineers from four major American aircraft companies have anti-gravity designs and data on their drawing boards pro uh, proving that whatever goes up does not have to come down. So this is the Daily News, November 9th, 1957. Exactly what Dr. Greer was talking about. So ladies and gentlemen, it's very clear that at least by 1955, they have made a breakthrough. I'm not talking about rockets. I'm talking about something completely different. Nothing having to do with piston reciprocal engines, jet engines, rockets. We're talking about a completely different propulsion system here. Now, we've been hearing so much about this December 17th 2017 New York Times article about um, these tic-tac-shaped UFOs that were tracked on radar by F-15 pilots. Uh, a better way to describe these would be cough uh, throat lozenges or something you would take if you had a cough. That might be something as, as a better terminology or the configuration of what these things look like. Cough drops or throat lozenges kind of within the same family of vehicles. I just wanted to point out that this is not, ladies and gentlemen, the first time these craft were seen. This is March 1967, uh, Wacom, Pennsylvania. A very similar tic-tac looking craft was seen. No visible means of propulsion, no jet engines, no propellers, no wings. It had what looked like rivets on the outside and it had these electrical probes that came up and there were three on either side for a total of six. So this is 1967. This is one of the cases that uh, I've been able to dig up within my personal files. So this is years before the F-18 got their thing. So we're already talking the technology was there. Now, I want to break into the three tiers of technology. I have to give, give credit to my good friend, Mark McCandlish. He's the one that coined that term, the three tiers of technology. Tier one, ladies and gentlemen, is the common, ordinary, garden variety, vanilla flavored aircraft. Your F-15s, your F-16s, your F-14s, the, the, uh, the star of Top Gun, that's what we're talking about with Tier 1. The common aircraft that you would see at your ordinary air show. Tier 2 is the previous black programs which have been declassified and put into the so-called white world. That includes the F-117A stealth fighter, the B-2 stealth bomber the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey that was declassified October 2002 during the Bush administration. That's tier two. Tier three is the classified unacknowledged special access programs which have virtually no congressional oversight and circumvent the quote unquote established laws of physics. That includes the 1989-1990 Belgian Triangle, the 1982 to 1989 Hudson Valley Boomerang sightings, and the so-called TR-3B Astra that was borne out by Edgar Fouché back in 1998. Now, I'm asking you the question, is there a fourth category? 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is a fourth category, and that is the unidentified submerged objects. 51% of all UFO cases are in point effect USO, unidentified submerged objects. We've got multiple cases within the Cold War of these gigantic 200 to 300 meter long torpedo shaped craft that were just blasting and bursting out of the ocean right next to our these Russian typhoon class nuclear powered submarines. This went on all throughout the 70s and 80s, documented cases of these strange craft bursting out of the ocean. Uh, doesn't appear to be anything man-made. So we could actually be looking at interdimensional tricksters as this fourth category. Now, why do we say that? Because as Jacques Vallée had talked about, uh, these USOs, these UFOs, they can appear and reappear at will. They can materialize and dematerialize at will. They've been seen going in and out of oceans. They've been seen going into the sides of rock strata and mountains at will. So we could be looking at interdimensional tricksters rather than extraterrestrial vehicles or extraterrestrial visitors. This is something we need to keep in mind. Now, within the military industrial complex, there's a couple of terms that they actually use. Uh, these are not terms I made up. These are actual terms that they actually use to describe this technology. Number one, it's called ace in the hole technology. Number two, it's called trump card technology. Number three, it's called silver bullet technology. Now they don't roll out these toys for just some national skirmish between some terrorist thing or, or a small thing. These are reserved for last resort type events, wars where they need to do a surgical strike. This is something that they do when they need something right now, immediate and mobile response, immediate response. This is the ace in the whole technology. Now, I'm going to talk about aerospace alley. Where do you go to see this? You as a taxpayer, where do you go to see this? This is called aerospace alley that starts in San Diego, goes up the five, almost the Pacific Coast Highway, going to the Los Angeles Basin, basin including Hawthorne, where Northrop is, heading north on the five, going by Burbank, where Skunk Works used to be, and then continuing on, breaking right on the 14, heading up to Palmdale, which basically is the uh, location of Air Force Plant 42, where Boeing has a lab, Northrop has a lab, and Lockheed Skunk Works Plant 10 is currently within Air Force Plant 42 Palmdale, continuing up the 14th Lancaster that takes you to Edwards Air Force Base and terminating in Mojave, which is scale composite. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is your aerospace alley where you as a taxpayer can actually see the buildings, facilities of where this takes place. At Air Force Plant 42, as we mentioned, this is the heart of the military industrial complex. If you went nowhere else in the world, this is the place to go. Air Force Plant 42 Palmdale, uh, basically near Palmdale Boulevard and 50th Street East is where you can go here. You are allowed as a taxpayer to drive around this facility. You can see these massive buildings where the B-2 final assembly plant was, is now, and then where they're building the new B-21. They're gonna be assembling that there. Lockheed Skunk Works is there too. Here's the layout of the sites. You can see uh, plant 10 on the lower left and the large runway. And this is the specific plan, plant 10, Lockheed Advanced Development Company. This is their layout. Uh, the building 601 on the central left part of this illustration, this uh, layout schematic blueprint, is where all the action takes place. These were the uh, classified aircraft within Skunk Works are assembled at this building 601. Now, one thing I want to point out here, and this is from page 196, Skunk Works uh, Vice President General Manager. About 80% of the group's work is classified. The other 20% we can't talk about. So ladies and gentlemen, what is the 80% that is classified? What has the Skunk Works been doing these last 40 years with our tax dollars? What have they been building? The evidence stacks up that a near certainty has been made in aircraft design. Yeah, it's already been done. Since 1954, they've already made the breakthrough. Now, I don't want you to get it twisted because Lockheed isn't the only show in town. There's other uh, aerospace companies that have their own quote-unquote skunk works. So not, Lockheed isn't just the only show in town. 
Boeing has something called the Phantom Works, which used to be McDonnell Douglas. So there's one that's based out of St. Louis. Northrop Grumman has something that they call the NATDC. Known as Northrop's answer to Lockheed Skunk Works, the NATDC combines the scientific and engineering advanced design capabilities of the aircraft in B-2 divisions. So that's the Northrop Advanced Technology and Design Center. That's their version of the Skunk Works. I want to point your attention to this very good book by J.W. Fulbright, published in 1970. It says, the greatest threat to American national security is the American military establishment and the no holds barred type of logic it uses to justify its zillion dollar existence. There is no better way to sum up that term. That's what they're doing. They're just, it's the no holds barred. They feel privileged to charge American taxpayers thousands, millions, billions more than these things should actually cost. Now, Detroit Free Press, here's another one that you can uh, track. Just wanna make sure that I'm showing my sources for this, not just making this up. This is February 8th, 1987. Secret ledger hides military projects. Pentagon black budget has tripled under the Reagan administration. This is the breakdown within that article that shows you here. So for procurement 1981, the black budget grew by just over half a billion dollars. This is 1981 at the beginning of the Reagan administration. Now, near the end of the Reagan administration in 1988, it grew by 9.122 billion. So there's this exponential growth. Federal spending by category for fiscal year 1988. Education was 25 uh, billion. Transportation is 28 billion. Pentagon's black budget for fiscal year 1988 was 35 billion. So ladies and gentlemen, we're spending more on the Pentagon's black budget than we are on education in this country. Total procurement funding for Air Force black budget was 51 billion of which 19.1 billion was classified within the Air Force budget. So that's what we were spending back in 1988. Now, this is a really important point because I believe this to be the Rosetta Stone for the Black World programs uh, within the Reagan administration. This is the Newsweek, June 8th, 1981, Reagan's defense buildup. This is it. This is the, the, the beginning, the genesis point of all these modern day Black programs. Even Jane's Defense Weekly, Aviation Week, Space Technology, December 24th, 1990, even they admit, quote, eight years of the Reagan administration in Washington were very good to the black world, even they admit it. So you as a taxpayer, how do you get this information? How do you find out where your tax dollars are disappearing and what they're spending it on? You as a taxpayer have every right to go directly to the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, and you can uh, request for your personal archives every January to hand this out. It is called the rdt and &E Programs R1. That stands for Research Development Test and Evaluation Programs R1, Department of Defense Budget for Fiscal Year 1994. You can get this for any year, and you can get it free of charge if you walk right into the Library of Congress, they'll give it to you. Now, within these documents, there's one for the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the Army. You get the Air Force one, and you start going through this rather boring multi-page document and they tell you what the program element number is which is on the left hand column and then over to the right they give you the code name for the program and they tell you what the total amount was spent so that's how you can figure out where your tax dollars are disappearing however when you get into the category of unacknowledged special access programs these costs start disappearing and they start using these ambiguous names to describe the programs because they don't want anyone to know. I'll give you a couple of examples. Senior year operations, forest green operations. There's no information on the program and nothing to tell you how much was spent. So ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is you take the total amount, you subtract the knowns, and what you're left with, ladies and gentlemen, is the black budget. A couple other ex examples here. Here's one, Copper Coast, no information, no funding uh, disclosure. Omega is another one. Theme Castle, Senior Citizen. Now, one thing I want to point out is the shorter the name, 
the more deep classified the program. Let me repeat that. The shorter the name, the more deep classified the program. So in this case, Omega would be more secret than Copper Coast. This I got from the uh, John Andrews collection, who was the senior project design engineer, Testers Model Corporation in San Diego. He did some fantastic work uh, on classified black budget programs. And here's a couple of uh, requests that he had made regarding these code names. Number one, Rosetta, that's another one. Housekeeping, Redbird, Rainbow, Snowbird. These are all within these classified programs. Now, another hobby of mine is tracking military aircraft procurement in our tax dollars. And where, where these billions have been disappearing, it's, it's incredible to find out where these things have been disappearing from. Editorials on file, Pentagate, $600 for a toilet seat cover. Is that really true? I mean, are we really spending $600 for a toilet seat cover? Are we really spending $400 for a hammer or is there something more going on here? Uh, rat hole, you can see all these billions getting sucked into the Pentagon, cost overruns, uh, shenanigans that they've been doing on the side, uh, Gold plating aircraft, different systems, just crazy. Here's another one. Uh, that's beautiful. What makes it go? Military industrial complex, bribery. So you can see those uh, high level military brass are in conjunction and in bed with the, with the suits over at the defense contractors. These guys are working hand in hand at the cost of billion dollars to taxpayers. We're the ones that are paying for it. Here's one. Uh, scrap it in, in order a new one. The ashtrays are full. That's the mentality of the military industrial complex. They'll scrap anything, They'll charge American taxpayers 10 times more than they should. Aerospace defense contractor Bonanza. We're talking about Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Boeing, Rockwell International, Northrop Grumman, McDonnell Douglas. These are the contractors that have been cashing in for years. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me hit you with this. Back in 1955, Kelly Johnson charged the American taxpayer a million dollars for the U-2 spy plane. So I ask you, does that sound like a, a reasonable deal? Does that sound like we're getting our money's worth a million dollars in 1955? You betcha. That's a, that's a really good deal. For the intelligence gathering capability that the U-2 provided, the CIA back in 1955, fantastic deal. In fact, something that's happened that has never happened before, Kelly Johnson ran the skunk work so efficiently, he actually returned money to the government. That never happens. It will never happen again. So in 1955, a million dollars, well worth the money, no doubt about it. Now, I wanna highlight this book, The Pentagon's, an insider's view, of Waste Mismanagement and Fraud in Defense Spending by Ernest Fitzgerald. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wanna ask you, take a look at this little puller here, this little block. It's about two inches in length, it's about three quarters of an inch wide, and it's about mm, just over an eighth inch thick. How much did American taxpayers spend on this back in 1982, 1983? right around $13,717. Just an unbelievable amount that's something that should cost no more than $3 each. Uh, here's the original price breakdown. 1982, it was $10,000. For this little machine block, in 83, it was 13,000. They finally settled on a price in, back in 1984 of $8,832. This is Pentagon, uh, page 214. What's interesting though, is the General Accounting Office did an audit of those parts and they found out none of them worked. So perhaps hundreds of thousands of these parts were made at 13,000 each and they all got scrapped. Here's another one, Washington Post, August 17th, 2007. Defense contractors was paid $1 million to ship two washers. Again, Washington Post, August 17th, 2017 a million dollars to, to uh, ship two 39 cent washers. Guess who paid for it? You and me, taxpayers. Here's one, uh, Pentagon is page 211. American taxpayers were charged $9,606 for a 12 cent Allen wrench. 
and the stories keep coming in and coming in. Here's another one. Taxpayers were billed $7,622 for the coffee maker installed in the C-5 military transport plane. New York Times, September 20th, 1984. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of accounts of this. Fraud, waste, and abuse. New York Times, March 30th, 2011. Audit of Pentagon spending finds 70 billion in waste. Incredible. Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor is $412 million per aircraft. I gotta repeat that, it's just incredible. $412 million per aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, that is more than the original cost for the B-2 stealth bomber back in 1981. How does a fighter cost more than a bomber? Just unbelievable, unbelievable. Just to prove it, <clears throat> here's the source, CNN, September 24th, 2014. Problem plague plane hits ISIS. F-22 goes into combat. The problem plague F-22 Raptor took part in its first combat mission Monday night, hitting ISIS targets in Syria. The price tag for those jets, which were in development for decades, is a staggering 412 million each, triple its expected cost, according to the GAO. Unbelievable. 648 F-22s were planned, but only 195 were built. Now, the one of the current poster childs for cost overruns is the B-2 stealth bomber. Originally, they were coming in at well under a billion dollars per each. They were, they were supposed to build 132. B-2 stealth bomber rollout November 22nd, 1988 in Palmdale. This is at the Northrop final assembly plant. Here's what I call the $10 billion photograph. At the end of production, they originally were proposed to have 132 bombers. By the time the production ended, they only built 21. So if you take the 22.4 billion that they already poured into the program, which you'll never get back, and you amortize that over the amount of aircraft that were built, it's 2.2 to 2.3 billion dollars per aircraft. And inside this plant, you can see one, two, three, four, times two is eight, so we're looking at nearly $10 billion per aircraft for the B-2 stealth bomber. 132 planned, only 21 were built. An $80 billion bust, Newsweek, December 5th, 1988, they asked the question, is it an $80 billion bust? Here's the cost breakdown, and you can see how the costs have risen as the years went by. In 1989, it was 274 million. In 1990, it was 530 million dollars per aircraft. In 1991, it was 864 million dollars per aircraft. And as I mentioned before, at the completion of the production run, it was 2.3 billion dollars per aircraft. Unbelievable. Time, July 31st, 1989. It says House Armed Services Committee Chairman Les Aspen estimates that the eventual cost of the stealth bomber will be 1.058 billion. That's a, that's a bargain. At that price, the 70 ton B-2 weighing equivalent to 2 million troy ounces would cost more than its own weight in gold. Unbelievable. So if you gold plated this thing, it costs more than just gold. It's, it's unbelievable the amount going on here. Now, the B-2 used to be the poster child for this over over costs and overruns. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a brand new poster child for fraud, waste, and abuse in military procurement spending. They have a name for this program. They call it the, the plane that broke the Pentagon's back. I'm talking about none other than the F-35, the Lockheed Martin Joint Strike Fighter F-35. It is currently, according to 60 Minutes, eight years behind schedule, $163 billion over budget, and in point of fact, the fixes associated with the program are more lucrative and profitable for Lockheed Martin than the actual aircraft itself. How do you get to be $163 billion over budget? If we as taxpayers are one day late paying our taxes, we get slapped on, we could eventually get sent to jail, but yet Lockheed Martin, they're $163 billion over budget and they get nothing. In fact, they get more money 
for the fixes. Unbelievable. How much does the F-35 cost? It's $355 million per plane for the Navy F-35 version. Here's the actual breakdown. <clears throat> you can see the Navy version, 337 for uh, that particular F-35C. Now, how much does it cost? How do we actually get a handle on this? The F-35 will cost a fortune. <clears throat> this is from ECN News 8414. I'm sure this comes as no surprise, but the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is expensive, very expensive, so expensive that according to one estimate, the money spent on the program could buy every homeless person in the U.S. a $600,000 mansion. Just unbelievable amount of being, being spent on these programs, just an unbelievable amount. Let's continue here. Are some black programs nothing more than a cover to hide the funding of even deeper unacknowledged special access programs? Ladies and gentlemen, that appears to be the case because some of that 163 billion may be actually funding even more deep black programs. That could be what we're dealing with here on the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Now, how do we put this into proportion? How do we put this into numbers? Where people can actually understand what this costs here. Now this is for <clears throat> military spending and the reference here is April 2nd 2013 from Battlefield. That's the source for this. Now this is cost per hour to operate these aircraft. The B-1 it's $57,807 per hour. The F-22 is $68,362. The B-2 is $69,708. Air Force One is 161591 and the B-2, ladies and gentlemen, is $169,313 per hour to operate. Per hour. Unbelievable. Now, I'm going to point you to this Aviation Week Space Technology article, November 11th, 1991. <clears throat> not going to read the whole thing, but just the top portion here. It says, two unusually loud sonic booms heard along the west coast from San Diego to north of Los Angeles may have produced, uh, may have been produced by high flying classified aircraft returning to test ranges in Nevada. 25 of the US Geologic Survey's 220 sensor system for pinpointing earthquake epicenters detected the passing shockwaves around 6.30 a.m. on October 31st. This is always on a Thursday morning. So I contacted uh, Caltech and they actually sent me the seismic data for this and they don't call this an earthquake, they actually call it an airquake or a sonic. So this is not a sonic boom, uh, this is not an airquake or an earthquake, this is some kind of a sonic event <clears throat> that rattled all these instruments. Here's the actual <clears throat> US Department of Interior, uh, just to show you where I'm getting this information. And these are the actual seismic printouts that took place over the early 1990s of these booms that always happen on a Thursday morning. So here's 10-31-1991, last Thursday of the month, and you can see there's a boom. <clears throat> and then about a minute later, there's another boom, which may actually be a chase aircraft following the original aircraft. Here's another one, 627.91, last Thursday of the month, always on a Thursday. There's a boom, a minute later, another boom. Here's one, 1121.91, it says, bingo, it must have been an American bird they didn't want to work on Thanksgiving Day. <clears throat> 7.17 a.m., 130.92, not the space shuttle, a massive boom, a little over a minute later, another boom, following right behind it. Catalina Island, 6.58 a.m., Thursday, April 16th, 1992, another boom. Here's the actual track going over Catalina Island, going over the L.A. Basin, waking everybody up in the morning on a Thursday, going over Edwards Air Force Base, and then heading to Area 51, Nevada. That's the track of where this aircraft is being tracked. Now, why a Thursday? Why are they doing this on a Thursday? Because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, Wednesday, those are reserved for pre-flight. Thursday is the actual test flight. 
Friday is debrief and Saturday, Sunday, there's nobody there. So that's why Thursday in the 80s and 90s was the reserve day for test flights. Los Angeles Times, April 17th, 1992. Secret is out on quakes. It's a spy plane. The rumble and bounce have occurred five times since last June, always about 7 a.m. on Thursdays. There were no earthquakes, but an aircraft, California Institute of Technology seismo, uh, seismologists say. All I can say is that it's something that's traveling through the atmosphere at several times the speed of sound in generally a northeasterly direction. Now, keep in mind, the shuttle was not flying on that day. The SR-71 was not flying on that day. So there was something else going on at that time. Here's one, Seattle Times, April 17th, 1992. Thursday morning shaker upper may be secret spy plane. It happened again Thursday morning. There was a brief rumble like somebody moving bulky furniture around and the ground lurched, San Gabriel residents said. Then just as they were about to head for their doors, uh, it was gone. So this is again on a Thursday. San Francisco Chronicle, April 18th, 1992. Weird jolts, no quakes in San Gabriel Valley. Analysts from James Defense Weekly, widely respected military periodicals say that the Thursday morning phenomenon could be a top secret new spy plane, dubbed the Aurora, that can fly up to six times the speed of sound or about 4,000 miles per hour. A very un unincredible, uh, very fast speed for that time frame at that time. Now, I want to take you on a typical mission profile for this. And this may actually be, <clears throat> according to Jim Goodall, used as a nuclear proliferation monitoring aircraft during the Cold War. So what would take place is this two-stage to orbit space plane <clears throat> would take off from Area 51. They would fly a magnetic 340 heading, go over Alaska. Then they would pour the coals over it over northern Russia. They make a left-hand turn starting down toward the Middle East. They would poured the coals to it there again, going about Mach 8 to Mach 12. Then they make another left-hand turn. Now they're under the southern tip of India, going over South China, and then continuing around the northern tip of Australia, going all the way there, and then ending up near Hawaii, making a banking left-hand turn, landing, landing back at Area 51. This could all be done in under two hours, very fast. Now, this is March 6, 2006. Bill Scott, who used to, used to be the Rocky Mountain editor of Aviation Week, he has to get the credit for this particular article because he's the one who spent over a decade tracking down stories of this two-stage to orbit space plane, which he believes to be called the Black Star System. And it consists of a mothership called the SR-3 and a smaller parasitic aircraft called the XOV or Experimental Orbiter Vehicle that is airdropped from the belly of the mothership at about Mach 1.2 at 25 to 30,000 feet. Here's a good illustration of what this looked like. The mothership actually uh, shows basically the original XB-70 and then what looks like a parasitic aircraft coming on the bottom of the craft. That's what this actually looks like. And you can see the uh, patent, this is February 7th, 1989, was the patent for this particular uh, design. That's 4,802,639 uh, was this particular patent. And you can see Boeing's version has a trans-atmospheric vehicle showing an aircraft being airdropped from the body of the mothership. This is exactly what the Black Star program looks like. This I got from uh, John Andrews, and this basically states that there was such a program and they may have suffered some type of an emergency right around February 22nd, 1994. Here it says, Dear Pete, the place, Kadena Air Force Base, the time, the weekend of 12, 13 February, 1994. Initiation action, emergency call from manned aircraft to expedite recovery at Kadena Air Force Base Coming from north, track speed at Mach 4.2, diversions for other aircraft in area. Aircraft recovered and quickly placed in a secure hangar, Red 3 lockdown, declared at base. Other pilots landing kept and slept in ready quarters. 
One white gray C-5C launched from Holloman Air Force Base rapidly. Three days of lockdown at base. So a couple of points to remember here. This craft was tracked going Mach 4.2. That's way <clears throat> faster than the uh, SR-71. And that there was a specially configured or modified C-5C that was flown there to Kadena Air Force Base, picked it up and flew it back to Holloman Air Force Base. This is what we believe to be a very accurate three view drawing of the Black Star XOV or Speedy. <clears throat> and there were uh, approximately three of these aircraft built. It comes in two versions. There's a 65 to 65, 90 foot version, which is a uh, single seat version. They have a two seat version as well. It's airdrop, as I mentioned, from the belly of the mothership. The back of the aircraft has two banks of four linear aerospike engines using a modified liquid boron fuel that uh, is shocked into a liquid state by a, a solid rocket booster. It has a very interesting, basically a tricycle landing gear with a nose gear and what look like outrigger wheels just outside the, uh, basically the wing root fuselage joint on the bottom surface. It has air brakes on the upper and lower surface of the aircraft. The entire bottom section of the aircraft is composed of space shuttle tiles taken directly off the space shuttle. These heat resistant thermal tiles. It had a stubby vertical uh, stabilizer on the top aft section, which appeared to be damaged. And the F-15 pilot who saw it at Holloman Air Force Base said that the bottom section had a number of panels that were missing. When, they were, when he was seen. It also has these four grooves running along the bottom surface of the aircraft, and then these red heat resistance sections on the leading edge of the wing of the aircraft. It has a Q bay on the upper section for the release of what are called depleted uranium rods from God, which is a non-explosive kinetic energy weapon. There's no warheads on this thing. It could also be used for the release of a reconnaissance satellite and for a very high accurate and resolution synthetic vision system or a synthetic uh, aperture radar system for the XOV. So that's in a nutshell the speedy aircraft. Now we'll move on to the mothership SR-3. Perhaps two of these were built for the entire Black Star program. Lockheed was involved, Rockwell was involved, McDonnell Douglas was involved and uh, Boeing was involved in Seattle for final assembly. The overall length of the uh, Paris mothership here is approximately 200 feet in length. It has a 120 foot wingspan. It uses six Pratt & Whitney J93 engines. And you can see here on this top view drawing, it has canards that retract backwards or forwards for low flight. And the bottom of the mothership matches the top configuration of the top of the parasitic aircraft. So there's this relief section on the bottom of this mothership where these smaller aircraft can fit up inside and it's airdrop when they get to the drop zone. This is an illustration that was done by Tom Bogan showing you what it looked like at Holloman Air Force Base when they unloaded this craft. You can see the uh, stubby tail with the tarp on top. And then the, the large feature here is this modified C5C with the chipmunk cheek extensions on either side. This is a heavily modified C5. And then you can see these veins or grids within the four linear aerospike engines, which are divided in two banks of two on the bottom section of the uh, Speedy here. Now, I want to talk about some legacy of the technology of the tier three craft here. Aircraft industry firms now participating or actively involved in gravity include the Glenn L. Martin Company of Baltimore, Convair of San Diego, Bell Aircraft of Baltimore, New York, Sikorsky Division of United Aircraft, Lear Incorporated in Santa Monica, Clark Electronics of Palm Springs, and Sperry Gyroscope of Great Lake, uh, Neck Long Island. So this is November 26, 1955, Amarillo Daily News. So already by the mid-1950s, they already had companies working to break the gravity barrier. We'll do one here. Spaceship Marvel scene, if science can outwit gravity. This is from 
Amarillo Daily News, November 29th, 1955. Many in America's aircraft and electronic industries are excited over the possibility of using its magnetic and gravitational fields as a medium of support for amazing flying vehicles, which will not depend on the air for lift. Spaceships capable of accelerating in a few seconds to speeds many thousands of miles an hour and making sudden changes, of course, at these speeds without subjecting their passengers to the so-called G-forces caused by gravity's pull are also envisioned. So what are we seeing here in this article? The reference works are clearly telling us that by the mid-1950s, they had aerospace defense contractors, universities working on cracking the gravity barrier, building craft that could eventually make these 90, 90 degree right angle turns that could stop on a dime, that could reverse. This is exactly the kind of aircraft flight maneuvers that we're seeing that match the form, fit, and function of UFOs and USOs, unidentified submerged objects. Now, we'll move on to Ryan Aerospace 1962, electricity for space exploration. Look at what they're doing here. Look at what the aircraft they were working on within their document. Within the next 10 years, according to their document, electric propulsion will play a leading role in making extensive space trips possible. They've already done it. Breakthrough's already been made. Cash Landrum incident, December 29th, 1980, involving Vicki Landrum, uh, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Colby Landrum, who basically on December 29th, 1980, near Huffman, Texas, saw a large 90 foot tall twin ice cream cone looking craft basically hover about 50 feet in front of their vehicle. Betty Cash actually got out of her vehicle, went to the forward section of her vehicle near her hood, and sat, uh, stood there looking at this for about a minute to two minutes as 23, repeat, 23 double rotors, Chinook CH-47 uh, helicopters were chasing this craft that was had this flame section coming on the bottom of it. When she got back into the vehicle, it was hot, but keeping in mind this is in winter time. And all three eyewitnesses suffered from the effects of radiation poisoning. This is back in December 29th, 1980. Now, what did they actually see? What was actually going on here? I submit that this is part of the NEPA program, the Nuclear Energy for Propulsion of Aircraft. And in this particular document, they indicate that for fiscal year 1960, by that time, by 1960, from 46 to 1960, the Atomic Energy Commission, the US Navy, and the US Air Force had already spent almost a billion dollars of procurement funding on nuclear powered aircraft, atomic powered spacecraft. And you can see in this drawing here, the cost breakdown and an atomic power reactor with a uh, subcritical reactor. So they've already done it, they've absolutely already done it. Now, I wanna highlight another technology here. Between 1983 and 1989, over 25,000 eyewitnesses reported a boomerang shaped craft the size of uh, an entire football field. It had tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom of the craft. It had a cross beam and girder construction that appeared to be inside what appeared to be translucent or transparent panels. And these multicolored lights were flashing in sequence. The reds would go off, the blues would go off, the greens would go off, the yellows would go off, all in sequence, not haphazardly. This is a drawing illustration uh, that was done by John McNeil, who did a fantastic job on this. This is March 23rd, March 24th, 1983, over the Taconic State Parkway, uh, about 30 minutes north of downtown New York City, where hundreds of people pulled off to the side of the road and saw this massive boomerang V-shaped craft hovering silently over the Taconic State Parkway. It was shining down this light onto the vehicles below, and it had these transparent panels showing people who were directly below this craft. They could look up inside, and it looked like what appeared to be cross beam and girder construction, like a truss bridge. This thing was nearly silent. Some uh, eyewitnesses reported a low frequency electrical humming noise like a tr uh, transformer. Here's the Hudson Valley boomerang breakdown, shows you the different configurations that we're seeing. Again, 
practically all eyewitnesses reported this tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom of this vehicle. A couple of characteristics here. Sightings of the craft came in from Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts. The craft was virtually silent and measured between 300 and 900 feet across. The UFO was seen hovering over expressways, lakes, and rivers. Object was reported by airline pilots, air traffic controllers, doctors, lawyers, local law enforcement, firemen, computer programmers. The craft appeared to have an industrial steel structural girder and crossbeam internal constru construction. Here's the Taconic State Parkway where this was actually seen. Putnam County, Dutchess County, Yorktown, Millwood, Danbury. This is where the heart of what the uh, Hudson Valley boomerang sightings took place. Now I put this drawing together showing you the flight path on the March 23rd, 1983 sighting. Starting at Millwood, going up toward Yorktown Heights, it was following the Taconic State Parkway, zigzagging its way as it was following the Taconic State Parkway. But here's the interesting point that I really want to point out. That this craft were basically, when they were seen by the eyewitnesses, it wasn't making this banking turn like a B2, but it was making this flat turn like it was on a pinwheel or on a, uh, a turntable. It wasn't making a banking turn, but this flat turn. Aircraft can't do this. We're talking uh, Harrier type technology, but this is no Harrier, absolutely not. So I put together a design and you can get blueprints if you want, you can request that to me, where you can build your own Hudson Valley boomerang. This is what the finished product actually looks like. Uh, what was that bright list, uh, brightly colored sky report on Thursdays here again? Object was seen from white New York to uh, as far as Yorktown. Object described seeing alternative colors between white and green as the object zigzagged across the sky to the north. Won't go into all these details, but the uh, highlights of the March 24th, 1983 sighting. Now this is one day after a very significant event took place. So at the intersection of 202 and 135, traffic was halted in a tangled jam as motorists stopped, got out of their cars, and looked up at the object. As I mentioned, this was one day after a very significant event, and that was the March 23rd public address to the nation for the SDI or Star Wars uh, Strategic Defense Initiative that was pitched by Ronald Reagan. So here we have Ronald Reagan, March 23rd, 1983, pitching Star Wars. Less than 24 hours later, we have these massive sightings of this huge boomerang shaped craft over the Hudson Valley area. Are the two events connected? Could the SDI program be connected to the Hudson Valley boomerang sightings? Could there be a connection? So there's two essential thoughts and schools of thought on the uh, Hudson Valley sightings. Number one, the object was a genuine UFO, extraterrestrial, could be a possibility. Number two, the sighting could be explained by a group of stunt pilots based out of Stormville Airport, also known as the Stormville Flyers. That includes subheading A, ultralights, B, small single engine planes, Cessna 152, 172. So I asked the question, is there a third option? Some, but not all, sightings in Danbury, Connecticut were attributed to small single engine Cessna 152 aircraft flying in formation. However, those who saw both the planes and the genuine Hudson Valley boomerang could immediately tell the difference. That's the thing. People who saw the planes and the actual boomerang said there was no comparison, completely due to two different events. This is a report from uh, Danbury, Connecticut, Night Siege, page 47. I saw flying, five planes flying together in formation around this field. They were trying to pull a hoax. I stopped at the rest area, got out of my car, and sat at a picnic bench to watch them. They would all turn their lights on at once from red to white. Those were the only lights they had. They were flying all around this valley. The first object I saw was definitely a plane. So even this person knew that they were trying to pull a hoax. This did not look like what the actual craft here saw. Loose groupings of planes became tight formations with as little as six inches between wingtips. Discover Magazine, November 1984. So in this article, they tried to completely discredit what actual eyewitnesses were seeing, and they tried to blame the whole thing on these formation flights. 
So what I did is I put together some illustrations depicting and showing people what it would have looked like to try to fake this Hudson Valley boomerang. And you can see here that in a straight and level flight, you could somewhat maintain position, although I wouldn't want to do this at night. Now, making a left-hand turn is where it gets interesting because pilots on the right, planes on the right, have to speed up. You know, it's, it's a simple matter, matter of mathematics and physics. To maintain formation, aircraft on the right have to speed up, but aircraft on the left have to slow down. But then it gets really interesting because if you make a flat turn, the aircraft on the right have to go up and to the left. The aircraft on the left have to go back and to the right. So there's just no way that planes flying in formation can actually duplicate what was seen in this illustration, the actual Hudson Valley boomerang. The lighting configuration stayed solid like they were embedded in the concrete. That's something that airplanes flying in formation just can't do. Now I want to point out this fact here uh, by uh, Abraham Lincoln. You may fool all of the people some of the time, you can even fool some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. So I want to state right up front that we just can't be fooled anymore. We're no longer going to take these lame excuses by the government that these are just planes flying in formation. We absolutely have a secret space program. The program is paid for by the American taxpayer. It is being run by the military industrial complex including Lockheed Martin, Boeing Phantom Works, Northrop Grumman, McDonnell Douglas, and also various uh, defense contractors like General Dynamics within the Reagan administration. And it's my goal in this presentation to expose the technology, hope it trickles down to the American airline industry for the uh, benefit of all mankind. And I definitely want to thank you for your attention. Hello? Yep. Okay. Oh, was that it? That was it. That was it. That's that was what it. I was cover. So you're saying the uh, craft that was seen over the Taconic was part of the secret space program? It wasn't? I'm, I'm, I'm stating that this may have been a over-the-horizon mobile airborne uh, radar system that was developed during SDI as a mobile over-the-horizon radar system. A man-made craft. Mm -hmm. How yep. far? I mean, how far do you think they are now in their secret space program? They're light years ahead. Well, mm -hmm. don't take my word for it. Ben Rich is the one who said that they had technology and things in Nevada that are 50 years beyond what you can even comprehend, coming directly from Ben Rich. Yeah, um, Ben Rich isn't around anymore, is he? No, he's not. He died in '95. He said we could have technology to take uh, E.T. home, right? I said that as well, yes. But where have we seen that? I mean, where do we, I mean, I'm sure it's true, but is it at Area 51? I mean, where is it happening? Well, where are we? We've seen that at Air Force Plant 42. We've seen that at Edwards North Base Complex. We've mm -hmm. seen that at uh, San Bernardino International Airport, which used to be Norton Air Force Base. So we've seen it in a number of different locations. Now, is this reverse engineered, do you think, alien technology that's, or our own creative? That's a $64 billion question. I like to stick completely nuts and bolts, and I track where our tax dollars are disappearing. So I can't make that leap. I can't bridge that gap. But if you just look at what was done within the military industrial complex during the eight years in the Reagan administration, it's clear there's a whole family of vehicles paid for by our tax dollars that has never even been revealed. At least another two dozen that we don't even know about. So we have the secret to anti-gravity now. Is this what you're saying? It's a no. According to the Council Bluffs from 1955, they were already making the breakthroughs in 1955. Now you factor in the decades from that time and the billions of tax dollars spent on those black programs. It's anyone guess what they have now. Wow. So do you think maybe what that um, video from December 16th that the New York Times wrote could have been one of ours? Yep. Yep. There's no reason to think that F-18 pilots would have a need to know 
about what's going on at Skunk Works. No need for them to know. Completely within the realm of reason of something at the Skunk Works is doing since they already were doing the breakthroughs in spending since 1955. No doubt about it. But Very this, this, there has to be some whistleblowers around this because in much in the technology, the people training, the people in charge, it's a huge operation. Where are the whistleblowers? Well, there have been whistleblowers, but keep in mind, when you are at top secret uh, TSCI, uh, uh, secured compartmented information, they stay black. These, these programs stay black. When you are in an unacknowledged special access program, they can control the secrecy. And people who worked in Burbank Skunk Works under Kelly Johnson and Ben Rich in Burbank, they felt it a privilege to work on the F-117. They didn't go out blabbing about it. It was a privilege to work on that program. So it's absolutely within the realm of possibility to keep these programs under uh, wraps. And there have been whistleblowers, uh, but it's been very difficult because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And without a piece of one of these things, it's, it's hard to prove the reality. Uh, but the F-116 is what, uh, that's known, that's a known piece. That, that, uh, is a, that is a tier two program. Yes, that is a tier two program. So the tier one program you're saying is the ET like the UFO like technology. No, the, the, the tier one programs are, are your common garden berry, uh, garden variety, vanilla flavored F-15s and F-15s. The tier two is the F-117 B-2 uh, Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey. The tier three is the Hudson Valley Boomerang and the Belgium Triangle. That's you the tier three. You think the Phoenix Lights were one of those boomerangs? Uh, I, uh, the Phoenix Lights could have actually have been an airborne holographic projector, according to the 2025 mm -hmm. report. But you do think there are UFOs out there, aliens? Oh, oh, there, there, there are USOs and UFOs, absolutely. But I'm not saying that they have to be extraterrestrial. They could be interdimensional tricksters. Mm. How will we know? How will we figure this out? Mm. See, that's the problem because keep in mind that the, the, Air, the Air Force, the DOD, the NRO, the CIA, they like to use the quote-unquote extraterrestrial phenomenon as a cover to hide their own deep black programs. And they now have craft that mimic the form, fit, and function of actual ET craft, quote-unquote. So now you can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference between an ET craft and one of these black projects. Perhaps. Yeah, and see, that, that's the thing. When there is a sighting of one of these black aircraft, the very next day, there'll be a, a report on the weekly world news about some alien thing, and they will pr promote that as a means to hide their own deep black programs, and they've been doing this for 50 years. You'll so see National, National Enquirer, front page news, new, new UFO sighting scene, right on National Enquirer. They've been doing this for 50 years. So wait, the whole Tom DeLong um, to the stars program, is, is this um, a decoy for the black projects um, going public? Is this what it could be? Mm, I don't know if I can make that professional assessment, but I, I can tell you that Lockheed Skunk Works, Northrop Grumman, have made some unbelievable aircraft that have never been seen. They're completely unacknowledged. And I can tell you right, right from the horse's mouth that any time you hear about an X plane that's been built by the Air Force by a contractor like X-51 or X-47, you can double the number. We're already past X-100. So take any X plane you hear about, double it. We're already past it. We already have X, X-100, X-120. We're already way beyond that. Uh, one question is, Stephen Greer says, you can tell the difference. It has seams and rivets in terrestrial craft. Is that true? That's, that's exactly correct. Yeah. When, when you have lights flickering in formation, when you have tubes, pipes, and rivets on the bottom of the craft, when you hear an electrical humming noise like a transformer or a sewing machine, and when it's tested on a Thursday night like Hudson Valley Boomerang was, it's one of ours. Why did you say they were only tested on Thursdays? Because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is pre-flight. Thursday is the test flight. Friday is debrief. And Saturday, Sunday, there's nobody there. That's been the policy all throughout the 1980s. So with this advanced crafts that you showed, this double triangle, do you think they 
been to the moon and Mars? You know, how far do you think they've been? I can't say for sure, but if you look at the research, if you look at the reference works, in 1954, they made the breakthrough. Now, I showed you four newspaper articles that back that up. Is Does that mean that Apollo was, I'm not going to say it's a hoax, but was it even necessary? Was Neil the first person to land on the moon? They, they were already making the breakthroughs in 54, so this is a decade before Apollo even landed. They could have done it. They could have done it. They could, so, but the purpose to keep, why don't they just tell us how it, I mean, what's the purpose of keeping it secret? It's, it's the same purpose and the reason why they keep on making F-16s and F-22s. It's profitable for them to do so. If they only brought out the toys for all this, all these lucrative contracts would disappear. So they have to keep on making F-35s. They have to keep on charging American taxpayers and they have to keep making these false threats and, and these false boogeymen so that we can propagate these lies so that contractors continue to cash in. That's what's going on. It's contractors in bed with the um, yes. yep. government. Remember, remember that, uh, that cartoon I showed you with the high level military brass in, in cahoots and in bed with the, uh, the suitors from the contractors? That is the arrangement they have that's been going on for decades. So you think the military people are getting kickbacks from the contractors yep. to give them the contract? Yep, it's called the revolving door phenomenon. When you, when you are a military brass working at the Pentagon and you help the defense contractor win a contract, when you retire at the Pentagon, that same company that got the contract, they hire you as a consultant. And so there's this revolving door. These guys can't lose. They can't lose. It's but to their advantage. Is there any money exchange after the contract while they're still in the military, you think, like secret bank accounts? There, there's got to be billions in these kickbacks and these gold platings of these technologies. And using obsolete things cost over, I showed you five examples of washers being shipped at, at uh, millions of dollars to ship two washers, coffee things that cost $6,000, tiny little brackets that cost $1.298, costs $13,000 and it just goes on and on. So the real question is, I think, if you were to go to Congress and ask for a congressional hearing, um, would th could this be exposed and could this all change? It's questionable whether members of Congress have a need to know because even the House and Armed Services Committee members, even they don't have a need to know. Most of those members are not even included in what's going on with scumpers. You know, there might be one or two that have a need to know, but the majority of those members, certainly members of Congress, have no need to know. All hundreds of members of congressmen, senators, congressmen, political figures, they are so down on the totem pole, they're completely clueless. But, but there is a need to know. I mean, someone like you can make a case and they are representing us and, the, and our money, and there is a need to know. There, there is a need to know when you're the person writing the checks. Let me give you an example. Uh, Defense Secretary William Perry, okay, he has a need to know because he's the one who cut the checks for Lockheed Skunkworks in Burbank under Ben Rich. So he has a need to know. Another person that has a need to know is uh, Dick Cheney. He has a need to know. And then former President George Herbert Walker Sr., these three people, if you want to know who knows the secrets, those three people know. But what I'm saying is everyone, all U.S. citizens, have a need to know. We're paying well, for it. They should because we're paying for it. It's, it's, it's written within the Constitution that by law, the United States government must show an, an accounting once per year of what they've been spending their, their tax dollars on. That, that's according to the Constitution, but we're not getting that. We're getting... A, a, a rdt &E program that's heavily redacted and we have no idea what they're spending on. Well, isn't there anyone in Congress that will stand up and say, we need congressional hearings on all of this? Well, remember that congressman uh, that was just talked about, Congressman uh, Harry Reid, in conjunction with the uh, senator from uh, Hawaii, 
Yeah. Okay, he talked about that secret army, secret air force with no funding and uh, complete congressional uh, ambiguity. He, you know, he would be someone that, that could have taken him to the task. I wonder if even he knew what was going on within Stump Works. Does, does, does anyone know in Congress? I mean, you know, can't you, well, can I don't, you send I don't your know. doctor? I don't know. I'm in the outside looking. Okay. I've been trying to penetrate it for 30 years. And, you know, there needs to be somebody like me doing the grunt work and being, you know, boots on the ground. But uh, it's, it's difficult to, the only way to get in is through Burbank, through Skunk Works, now at Palmdale. Because I think they are at the heart of the whole thing. They're absolutely at the heart of the whole thing. Uh, the, the United States Navy is involved as well. The Atomic Energy Commission, the CIA, the NRO, the NSA, they're all involved. But above anything else, Skunk Works all the way. Skunk Works is a private industry, though. Skunk Works is Lockheed Martin. Skunk Works right. is located in, in Palmdale. But yeah, even uh, Richard Dolan knows that when you have a, a, a company proprietary program, it is exempt from FOIA requests. So you can't attack it that way. It cannot be right. That's a what proprietary the... program. It has to be something paid for by taxpayers. But yeah, so... Uh, I mean, someone needs to stand up in Congress and say this needs to be investigated. Let, let me give you an example. I would estimate, this is just my assessment, yeah. less yeah. than 1% of Congress knows about what's going on. And I can tell you that because in, even in Ben Rich's own book, Skunk Works, and I can tell you the page number, uh, General Robert Bond, who was a high-level general, who was part of the original blue team, back in 81, setting up the stealth program very early on. He knew about F-117. He was at the bottom level of the Skunk Works in Burbank where there's a vault and he was walking past the vault and Ben Rich was with him. And he said, uh, Ben, what's going on in that vault? Because he thought that uh, money and resources were being taken away from his stealth fighter program. He said, damn it, Ben, if you don't tell me what's in that vault right now, I'm going to take that ax and I'm going to chop down that door. He had to get a security clearance and a, a brief on a, a separate Navy program. He didn't even know what was going on there. So this high-level general Air Force guy who's in charge of the entire stealth program was completely clueless what was going on within the Navy on a different program. So if he couldn't get access, you know senators can't get in. Did he ever find out what was going on in there? He, he found out on that particular one, but he died in a crash of a MiG-23 back in 84. And all the secrets died with him. Do you, and think, what that was, do you think that was intentional? I don't think so, because it's a, it's a uh, difficult bird. He was going through the test range uh, somewhere along Mach 1.2. And there was something going on with the stability. The whole thing swapped ends. And as he came out, he hit his head on the canopy rim. And he was parachuted down. He was already dead. Now, that's the alleged story. There are some other people who think that he was testing a completely separate aircraft that's never been talked about. Now, that's difficult to prove. They all say it was a MiG-23. And now I'm going to stand by that. But there is more to the general bot story than meets the eye, no doubt. So how many people you feel are in the there's the Skunk Works people. How many military people must know about it too, right? It would be only the people who work in the black. If you do not work in the black, you're not clued in. You don't have a need to know. You would not have a high enough security level. You would not be in the unacknowledged special access program. You have to be what's called one of the pioneers of stealth, quote unquote. You have to be one of those members to know what's going on. And who are those people? Who are it's a, it's a very small group of about 130 men. And now there's women involved as well. But they are the original pioneers of stealth. They meet once a year at a different location. And they discuss uh, between themselves the programs that they work on. Now, we know some of them. One's the Have Blue. One is Tacit Blue. One is F-117A. One is B-2. Another one is the Boeing Phantom Works Vertebrae, and there's a whole host of others that we don't know about. Those people know the secrets. But can you name any names? Can you name anybody? Uh, I, I can name names. Uh, ben Rich was one of them. Uh, Mr. Shearer, uh, 
There is another one. Keith Bestwick was one of them. Uh, let's see, Dennis Overholzer. He was another one. He's a pioneer of stuff. I, I know some of the names offhand. Any military people that you could? Uh, yeah, uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, Dennis Bones Sager. He is a test pilot. He knows. Uh, J.D. J.B. Brown. He knows. Some of the test pilots he knew are dead now. Uh, another one is Joseph Laney, Colonel Joseph Laney. Do you want to know who knows? Colonel Joseph Laney at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. He knows. He knows. I talked to his. I talked to one of his supervisors, yeah. and uh, I know he knows the fact. I just know he knows. He flew something called the YF-24 that has never been revealed to the public, and a whole host of other aircraft. What about the Lockheed uh, Skunk Work guy who's now working with Tom DeLong? What, what's his name? Do you know he's on? Steve the, Justice. Um, his name is Steve Justice. And I, yeah. I spoke well, to him. I spoke to him by phone. I, I know him. I never met him personally. He knows a very big part of this puzzle because he was at Skunk Works. He's the number two man at Skunk Works for decades. So, yes, he knows. Now, I only spoke to him once. So I can't say what he knows, but I, I guarantee you he knows a very significant part of the story. Why did you speak? How did you get to speak to him and what did he say? Because I applied for a job at Skunk Works and he told me they're no longer doing drawings anymore. <laughs> so I was out of luck. But it doesn't matter. I'm going to continue on. And he's not the only show in town. So my final question, I don't think we have any other, um, because we should wrap up. What do you think To The Stars Academy is going to be doing and how does that tie into uh, letting the public know about these uh, dark projects? Well, you know, it sounds great on paper, right? Now here we have a new group coming out. We just had footage released. We're a, we're a month past the footage. His, his new organization was launched in October. Yet here we are a month later. You still have to pay your taxes. You still have to go to work Monday morning. Nothing has changed. We don't have any physical evidence. We don't have any more gun camera footage. We don't have any more documentation. We don't have any real solid information to break this case through. And I don't foresee that coming. Even if we did, it's, it's still not enough. It's still not enough. They are still holding on to the real good data. We don't have enough firepower. Uh, we, don't, we really haven't made any real big moves forward. That's just my assessment. We're going to need a lot more. So you think they're just dangling a carrot in front of our face with like, or they, mu they must have a plan to do something. Well, all, all I will say is uh, astronaut Gordon Cooper, he knew how it would be done. And the only way, according to astronaut Gordon Cooper, the only way that this is ever going to break through is if the technology associated with these vehicles is handed down to the scientific community and they come together as a united coalition. That's the only reputable way that this is going to break through. And until and unless that happens, we're not going to get there. Do you think that could be what they're going for or probably not? At, at the rate they're releasing information at a trickle, we could be decades away from getting to where we need to be. What we need is a massive exponent uh, expose. We need a, a complete clearinghouse of the dozens of vaults where this information is. Now, you know, you know that there were B-29 films taken after World War II where, where these things were uh, captured on film with all the cameras rolling. We're the talking 70 years they've been capturing yeah, these. They've been capping all the things from Vietnam, all the things from Desert Storm, all the things from World War II, the Korean War, all those gun camera footages would be a tremendous uh, advantage to getting this out. All the testimony from those people, they probably have some type of hardware. That's a different story, but it's that kind of physical evidence and documentation that it's going to take to move this through in conjunction with the scientists. It can't just be the evidence. You've got to have the eyewitnesses, engineers, test pilots to come together as a united coalition, just as Gordon Cooper had said, and that's the only way we're going to get there. Well, we could be on the verge of that kind of revolution. We could, we, we could be, but at, at the rate we're seeing it, we, we could be decades away. Decades away. Wow. Well, this guy David in the chat room says, I witnessed a U.S. anti-gravity stealth 
like Gagroth in North Carolina, heading towards the Bohemian Grove. Yeah, there you go. The Bohemian Grove, like that's a whole other discussion. It's but, a whole other thing. You know, but they're no. somehow connected to the black budgets, right? It could be. It could be. Even even Phil Class, the arch nemesis of Phil Class, even he yeah. knew on his dying day, he, he issued a, and I, I, I put this in my original presentation, and it caused a stir, and I wanted it to because I wanted people to think. He knew that uh, on his dying day, he said he, he issued a, the UFO curse, and in a nutshell, paraphrase, is he said that, you know, you will never know more about UFOs as you do today. On your dying day, you will never know, know more about UFOs, what they come from, what their origins is, and you will be like that until your dying day, and you will remember this curse. That's essentially what Philip Class said, and he's been right. We're 70 years into it. We still don't know exactly what this phenomenon is, and we, we still don't know. There, there doesn't appear to be anything on the foreseeable future unless they come together as a scientific community, we're, we're just never going to get there. Well, thank you, Michael. Maybe yep. your research and presentation and um, having people talk about this will, I mean, and the whole webinar we're doing today will crack some uh, doors open. I hope it does. I hope it does. Because I'm, I'm sure there's government people listening to this webinar. That, you know, I hope they do. I hope they do. Okay, so how can people find you? Uh, I'm on Facebook. You can just Facebook me or you can email me. It's A-U-R-O-R-A-C-A-D-5 at AWOL.com. All my things are free of charge. Everything I do is free of charge. All my presentations are on YouTube. And if you want to win the $1,000 cash prize, you have to finish my, uh, my uh, crossword puzzle by Tuesday, 11.59 p.m. California time. Oh, yeah. Where can we find that crossword puzzle online? You can, you can email me and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll send you a copy. Okay, your email again is what? It's A-U-R-O-R-A-C-A-D as in dog, the number five at AOL.com. Or you can, you can uh, find me on Facebook and look at my contact and my email is there as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all your research, your contribution, your hard work, for sure. Thanks a lot.